Thank you for the introduction. Um, first, I'd like to thank uh, Sotera for organizing this nice symposium and for inviting Synopsis. Um, yeah, you heard a little bit of, about my history. I will not go into detail, but uh, if you want to know more, we can talk about it uh, after the symposium. So, but currently I'm working as an R&D engineer at uh, Synopsys, and I'm working on the software development for design tools for photonic integrated circuits. Um, so I was asked to give a, a talk about uh, how they are being used uh, in today applications of life sciences and I can tell you I had a bit of a struggle to get a presentation. So it's still all very experimental. But I tried to do my best. Um, first, a uh, single slide about Synopsys. Uh, Synopsys is the number one EDA um, provider of uh, software tools and services. And um, that is EDA is Electronic Design Automation. So these are the software tools that you need to get from your silicon wafer up to a chip. And Synopsys is really supplying all the different tools that uh, you need uh, through that whole chain. Uh, Synopsys is a big company. Uh, we're looking at about uh, 3 billion of revenue for the year of 2018. Uh, currently, there are about uh, 13,000 employees, and um, I'm currently working from an office in the Netherlands. So, let's get into um, the actual applications. Uh, I first want to address an application area of the uh, immunoassays, and there I found this really interesting company, Genolite. So, Genolite is making test equipment for these immunoassays. And uh, it's an interesting market, so a lot of money goes around in it. And uh, it's in the billions. So, but what I find really interesting in this application is that they are using disposable photonic integrated circuits for the tests. So, I'd like to show you a bit more on uh, how that works. So this is the Maverick system of Genolite, and this is the system that uh, will do the testing. Uh, the, it has the light source. Light sources are a lot, uh, often problematic on disposable chips, so you have to couple it. But, um, this is an assay kit, and um, you have the tray where you can add, uh, where you can put in all the analytes. Um, you have a USB drive that you can stick in the machine so that it is uh, properly initialized for that specific tray. And then this is uh, the interesting part. Uh, that's the auto array. The auto array, these uh, little pins here, are microfluidic channels. And these microfluidic channels are being put into the analyte. This is all automated. And the microfluidic channels, they uh, pull in the analyte and then they are being led across the silicon chip. So here you can see the silicon chip. And on the silicon chip, you have two microfluidic channels. And there the analyte is being passed through uh, 16 uh, uh, detectors. So you can put in 16 different analytes uh, to test. Um, each of the detectors consists of four sensors, and these are all independent sensors. Um, these sensors are based on uh, a component in, uh, that we use a lot in integrated uh, photonic circuits, and that's the ring, uh, the micro ring resonator. And the micro ring resonator, here you can see the ring. And at the bottom, you can see a straight channel. Uh, in this straight channel, you have a whole spectrum of light going through. Um, but the ring only resonates for a specific wavelengths of light. So in this case, um, it's, uh, being re it's resonating in the blue light. If you take a look at the end of the straight channel, 
and you analyze the spectrum, you will see this uh, notch. So you're missing the light there, and that means that's your resonance light uh, of the ring. So now you start flowing the microfluidic channel across it, and the microfluidic channel has uh, all the analytes in the fluid. So this ring is uh, functionalized for a specific analyte, and in this case it are the orange ones. And I don't have any biology background, so I will not go into the mechanics of that. But um, I can, the shift, the color change, uh, you can compare that uh, like uh, in church you have the organ and uh, you have organ pipes and they resonate for a specific tone. And um, if you spray paint these organ pipes, you will notice that the tone will change. And that's basically what's happening here as well. The analytes bind to the ring, and so the, you get a little bit of mass on the ring, and then the frequency of the light will change. So you will see your notch is shifting, and this is the frequency shift of the ring. Uh, normally, the analytes give you a weak signal, so you can add beads that will bind to the analyte, and that will add more mass to your ring, and then you will get an even higher frequency shift. So, if you monitor this uh, real-time uh, frequency shift, you can get a signal from all your sensors, and your frequency shift is directly proportional to the uh, concentration of the analytes. This whole test, and that was mentioned this morning as well, only takes 15 minutes. So in 15 minutes, you're analyzing 32 different analytes. So the pick advantages for this application, um, it's, no, uh, it's a uh, solution with no labels, um, no contamination because these are disposable chips, so you use them once and throw them away, no crosstalk, sometimes with uh, uh, illuminance you can have crosstalk from other sensors. Um, and, uh, yeah, integration possibilities. And if this is getting to a high volume, you can get to a low cost. Uh, multispectral sources. Um, multispectral sources are used a lot in uh, um, biosciences. So you have the confocal uh, microscopy, uh, DNA sequencing, and flow cytometry. So I think we, well, a couple of them already passed uh, in different uh, talks. Um, I want to show an application of uh, photonic integrated circuits for the flow cytometry. Uh, this is the optical system for a flow cytometry system. And you have the molecules, they are just going in a single file um, through a single laser beam. So every time when the laser beam hits a molecule, you get forward scattering, and the forward scattering gives you information about the cell size, and you get side scattering. And the side scattering can, uh, if you are labeling your molecules, uh, you can have side scattering in different colors, and if you analyze that, that will give you another dimension, and then you can make a nice two-dimensional plot that will give you information about uh, uh, all the molecules that are, pa all the cells that are passing through. Um, this whole equipment can be made more accurate and more sensitive if you use four different colored lasers. So if you have four uh, focused laser spots uh, above each other and then you flow the cells uh, through and then you analyze um, the, the signals of your detectors, uh, you can make everything more uh, accurate. And here you can see um, an uh, optical bench set up to combine like four different wavelengths. And this optical bench is like almost a square meter uh, with all the lenses and filters. And here you can see the same device being fabricated in a uh, chip 
and this is in a silicon nitride platform, and there, then you are talking about a chip of a couple of centimeters. Um, one more application, uh, optical coherence tomography. Uh, here we have a company, Dermalumix, and uh, optical coherence uh, tomography is being used for um, eye testing and also for um, uh, der dermatology. And for the dermatology, you can use this analysis um, to determine uh, skin cancer. It's basically the same as a sonogram, but now you're using light and not sound. So um, the equipment that you need can be a bit bulky. And Dermalunix um, integrated this into a single uh, photonic integrated circuit. And this photonic integrated circuit here is packaged into a module and here it ends up into the scanner. And then you end up with a nicely um, portable uh, device. So these were a couple of applications of uh, photonic integrated circuits in uh, life sciences. Now I'd like to talk a little bit more about the actual photonic integrated circuit. We've seen this picture already a couple of times as well. This is the cross section of a waveguide. And in this case, it's a uh, silicon nitride waveguide on oxide. Uh, you can see also the size. In this case, it's about half a micron. So you can really confine light in a very small space. Um, if you go to a silicon waveguide, you can even go a lot smaller. Um, so that's a main purpose in the applications that we saw to guide light and to miniaturize uh, circuits. Um, Another thing, also already mentioned, is the evanescent field. So that's an important thing. So at, at certain areas of the chip, you want to sense. So there you don't want to have the light uh, captured in the waveguide, but you want to have it extending outside of the waveguide. And that's uh, the evanescent field. And here I just show two setups how you can do that. So you can make a slot waveguide by having two waveguides close to each other you can confine the field uh, between them, or you can use uh, surface plasmons. So by applying metals, it's possible to guide light on the surface of the metal while most of the light extends into the uh, liquid that you want to analyze, for instance. So this all sounds great. So why aren't there that many applications? Um, first of all, all the semiconductor industry is based on Manhattan layouts. Everything is straight and you only have straight corners. If you take a look more at the optics uh, layouts, you're looking more at nice curved, uh, curved roads. So here you can see the layout of an electronic chip and here you can see the layout of an optics chip. So that's a big difference. And these curves come with a cost. Uh, here you can see if you take an electronic approach of guiding light. So the light comes in here and you make a straight corner and then you lose uh, most of your light. Uh, and another big problem is uh, a lot of the light goes straight back and that normally goes straight back into your laser and your laser doesn't like it. So, you really have to design this better. So you have to find out what is my optimal curvature. So in this specific uh, design environment, you start going to 10 microns of radii that you need for the bend. But this is just the top dimension. If you take a look at the cross section, um, if you design these circuits, you really need to have a lot of knowledge of the technology platform. Because there are all kinds of things um, within the technology that can affect the performance of your devices. 
So here um, at the top you design a certain width of wave kite and then you start processing it and oh, we've got under edge. So this means that your wave kites are not guided anymore. With uh, electronics you maybe would have survived, but with optics your chip is dead. So you have to start biasing your design. This is just a simple example, but uh, you need a lot of knowledge for um, getting the right wave guides out of your process. So if you want to get from an idea to an actual chip, you've got a lot of nice layout tools and, and uh, simulation tools, and Synoptus will be happy to sell them to you. But um, what really, um, and that uh, is what we heard from PEC Bio, um, what really improves the design capability is when you start capturing the knowledge of the foundry platforms into libraries. And these libraries are called process design kits. So you start capturing all these uh, uh, annoying things like uh, minimum curvatures, uh, under edge, etc. You don't want to deal with that as a designer. So this uh, library has um, building blocks that are already validated that they work and they take care of all the technology aspects. They also have design rules that will check if your um, chip has uh, the correct layout. Uh, here you can see two platforms that uh, are being developed in a European project, Pix for Life. Uh, that's the Biopix uh, platform from iMac and uh, the Triplex uh, platform from uh, Lionix. And Synopsys is doing a lot of work on getting good PDKs in place. But suppose you're getting a nice chip. Uh, it still needs to work in the outside world. This is the core of a monomode fiber. And this is a wave kite, this black spot. So if you just glue them together, you probably get like half percent of light into your wave kite. So that's uh, challenging. So to do this right, you start dealing with lensed fibers and uh, additional process steps for the chips. And that is really painful. And uh, you have to actively align this afterwards. Uh, but there are now a lot of uh, technology modules being developed. Um, iMac has now a lift module uh, that gives you an alignment tolerance of more than 10 micron. So they are now making disposable uh, chips for uh, sensing that can be just plugged into a system with any, without any of a active alignment. And if you are not taking care that your pick uh, actually needs to be packaged, you can get these kind of disasters. So here you can see the wire bonds going everywhere. So you know this will never end up in a product in the market. This is not really manufacturable. So you want to have the software already have templates for the packaging that are known by the packaging houses on how to connect them. So these kind of things are also being implemented in these process design kits. So all to give the designer a head start uh, on designing these kind of circuits. Uh, Synopsys now sees that photonics is getting more important and they came up with uh, driving the pick uh, revolution. So they think uh, we are on the edge of a revolution. Um, but uh, to really get there and to make that a success, we need foundry platforms that are stable and that are validated. We need to capture all that data in uh, good PDKs and we need uh, good solutions for the packaging. When you have these three working together well, then you can start getting applications. Uh, the problem is there are not many applications, so people don't want to work on this, and then people don't want to develop the applications because the top three parts are not there. So it's a vicious circle. So that's a real chip. So the, with this symposium, we're also trying to break this circle. So there are a lot of possibilities. 
So to summarize my talk, there are really exciting uh, products being developed right now for PICS. And the challenges are being addressed. So um, the foundries are getting uh, better platforms. The PDKs are getting more mature. Uh, more design rules are being put in place. And uh, standard technology modules are being developed. Um, but to make this big revolution a real success, what we really need is volume. And that's why I like the disposable chips a lot, because uh, it's nice if you can throw them away, because we need more wafers. <laughs> so, and that's where I think the life sciences area can really play a big role. So please come up with uh, nice applications with lots of disposable chips <laughs> and then everything will become better. <laughs>